Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Tonight's episode is a special edition of The Journey Home. Uh, it's one of, we haven't done a round table in a while, but we, I had two reasons for thinking about doing this this evening. One, I had some friends in the studio. Uh, Ken Hensley is a former Baptist minister, former guest on The Journey Home, and Dr. David Anders, former Presbyterian, both guests on The Journey Home. Guys, welcome thank to The thank Journey you. Home. Marcus, thank you so much. Good to have Good you back. Here. Great pleasure. But the other reason that I thought, well, I got you here, but also uh, recently we had heard that we're anticipating the canonization of uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman this, uh, about a year away, mm -hmm. this fall, <clears throat> this winter. And um, I thought we'd use that as an excuse to talk a little bit about history in our journeys. I'm sure for the upcoming year, there's going to be lots of EWTN programs on Newman and his effect on the church and and such, but I thought we'd kick it off, not so much a discussion about Newman, but about the place of history. And we're basing that idea on a statement that Newman himself made, which we've said many times in the journey home, in the introduction to his essay on the development of Christian doctrine, he says, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. So before we get into that specific discussion, though, let's just remind the audience of our journeys so they know where we're coming from. I'd begin with you, Ken, if we would, really quickly. And just for you, those of you at home, <clears throat> our, our full journeys are all on the Journey Home yeah. website, so uh, Coming Home Network, uh, chnetwork.org, as well as EWTN's website, of course. But uh, a quick summary. Okay, I'll attempt that. I'll attempt that. Um, radical conversion to, to Jesus Christ at the age of 22 um, basically, just reading the New Testament and reading some apologetics works by C.S. Lewis, Josh McDowell, some of the others, um, I came to faith in Christ in a totally non-denominational evangelical environment. Um, three and a half years later, I was married. My wife and I went to uh, I went away to Bible college where I got my undergraduate degree in Bible and theology, and then went to Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. Received my master's degree there. Um, I was intending to go on uh, in an academic kind of path, but I was invited to come on a staff at a church as an associate pastor, and I thought I'd take a break from academics and uh, wound up never getting back to it. So I, was ordered, I, have, I became a youth pastor in a Baptist church. Um, three and a half years later, I was ordained into the American Baptist denomination on the West Coast, California, and uh, became the senior pastor of a church, and I was a senior pastor for 11 years. So um, I was pretty much, I guess, <clears throat> Baptist in my theology, uh, you know, non-denominational, evangelical, they're all Baptists, it's all sort of the same thing. Um, on the Calvinistic side, so I guess Reformed Baptist in my theology, really. And then, um, am I talking about conversion too? I guess just a word about yeah, yeah, it. Coming yeah, coming into the church. Yeah. Well, what happened was, I, I found out out of the blue that Scott Hahn had become a Catholic. And okay. Scott Hahn is someone that I had known about a decade before. And I knew that he was not a Catholic, you know. And anyway, um, I was just pastoring my church when a guy at church comes up to me one evening and just drops his bomb on me that he has a set of tapes by someone named Scott Hahn. And uh, I took the tapes, went home, I listened to his conversion story, and I had never thought about becoming Catholic. And when I heard his story, it was just a, a curiosity welled up in me to know more, really. To know. Basically, the question I had was, you know, how could I have gone this far in my, in my learning and not know the case for the Catholic faith. And here's uh, someone that I had respected when I knew him, someone I knew was very bright, making the case. And so, um, short version is I tracked Scott down the very next day, and I began to talk to him, and I began to read, study. Uh, thus began about four years of rethinking my entire Christian worldview from the ground floor up. And in 1996, in September, I resigned my ministry uh, to enter the Catholic Church. My wife and I were brought in Easter Vigil of 1997. John Henry Newman yep. uh, had uh, a lot to do with, um, had a prominent place in my conversion, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. A little bit later. Thanks, Ken. Sure. I appreciate it. Dr. Anders. Marcus, thank you. So I also raised Protestant, Evangelical, Presbyterian, not Baptist. I had a deep antipathy towards things Catholic, did not regard the Catholic Church as an option at all, saw Catholics as objects of conversion. So when I went through my path of study, seminary and graduate school, I thought I could do no better in my Christian formation than to study the guys that I thought were the fathers of the church, Martin Luther and John Calvin, really the founders of the Protestant movement. 
and in particular, studying their reasons for rejecting the Catholic faith. Mm. And I really tried to rethink their polemic against Catholicism after them. And I spent a great deal of time, many years of my life as a PhD student, studying the world of late medieval Catholicism, 15th century, 16th century mm. Catholicism, understand what they were reacting against, what they borrowed from Catholicism, really get my head wrapped around that pivotal period of history. And the end result of that was that I discerned that I was in the wrong church, that the Catholics had the better side of the argument. History was integral to my conversion at, at several levels. One of them was at the level of the Reformation itself. I grew up an evangelical Protestant. That's a very revivalistic tradition. That mm. If you know the tradition, you know it owes mm -hmm. a lot of its roots to the revivals of the 18th and 19th centuries. And there's a kind of an expression of Christian spirituality and of faith that I found remarkably absent from the writings of the reformers. The whole sort of hmm. invite Jesus into your heart, pray to receive Christ, conversionistic account of hmm. Christian life is something that came into the Protestant world really in the 19th century. You don't find it in the 16th or even the 17th or 18th centuries. And there were other, there were similar things, but I realized, you know, the, what I've always taken to be the gospel, I can't find in the men that my church recognizes as its own founders. Mm. And that shook my mm. confidence in the notion <coughs> that Scripture alone was a, a, a sound basis of handing down the deposit of faith. Protestantism also is a, a tradition that is committed to the doctrine of primitivism, the idea that we should go back to Christian antiquity to find a mm. model for Christian life. And Luther viewed himself that way. Calvin saw themselves as men that were going back to antiquity to refashion Christian life on an antique model. So I assumed that vision was true. And when I went to study Christian antiquity, I found a very Catholic expression of faith. And so that, that view of Christian history fell apart for me. But I also learned that the idea of primitivism, where do we even get this idea? Does the New Testament tell us that we should regard the New Testament as an ideal form of Christian life? I think it'd be hard to make that case, given that most of the letters of the New Testament were written to churches in crisis. I studied more and I found out, you know where the idea of primitivism comes from? It's a Catholic idea. <laughs> and it ultimately traced back to the monastic movement, the Cluniac reforms of the high Middle Ages, those monastic houses that wanted to reformulate their own lives according to a primitive monastic rule. That, in turn, gets translated into the papacy of Gregory VII, and so the whole idea of let's reform the church and go back to a pristine model was circulated in Catholicism 500 years before Luther ever thought mm. of picking it up. Mm. And there's one thing after another began to unweave my conception of the world, mm -hmm. the Christian faith, the Bible, the, the whole course of Christian history began to unravel in front of me. And uh, it led to a deep crisis in my own life. Mm. And uh, it was only when I finally tried on the idea of becoming Catholic, that the crisis could resolve and I could see my way clear to, uh, uh, to an intellectually fulfilled Christian life, but it was either a Catholic or nothing. Newman, of course, was a significant figure, I mean, along with so many other great Catholic theologians, but Newman helped me in a number of ways. One of them, his, his idea of the development of doctrine. I was a historian of Christian doctrine. My field of study was the history of Christian doctrine. So. Newman's ideas uh, made immediate sense to me. It was, a, it was a, a much more sensible way of construing Christian history. The Protestant way was pristine purity, fall, recovery. Mm -hmm. Newman's view was a progressive development of doctrine. That was a much more sensible way of construing the data. There were also specific doctrines that Newman helped me with, in particular devotion to the Blessed Mother. Newman showed how, how ancient... Catholic Marian dogma is in the church. And he did an interesting thing for me. In his essays on Mary, he points out not only is this an ancient doctrine, but he shows the Catholicity of the doctrine, meaning that you can find it in Egypt, you can find it in North Africa, you can find it in Southern Europe, in Italy, in the Holy Lands, in, in, the, in the Eastern countries. It was widespread across the ancient Christian world, not just ancient, but, mm -hmm. but Catholic. And that introduced me to a way of thinking about evaluating theological questions, not only their biblical basis or antiquity, but their Catholicity. Mm -hmm. I mean, his thinking is, is Catholic in the fullest sense of the word, mm -hmm. through and through, and I found it such an intellectually illuminating way to look at the data. And uh, 
Uh, so there are many other ways in which Newman helped me. He's just a, a profound individual, of yeah. course, and I, I uh, was happy to follow him into the church. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Normally when I did a, a, a round table, I'd have three guests, and then i just sit back as the host. But since I'm the third, let me give a little summary of my journey, and like yours, mm -hmm. mine's on the, on the website. Although the thing that gets harder and harder for me as I try to re remember my journey is that I hear so many journeys. After a while, I wonder, was that my journey? Was <laughs> that theirs? You know? And I'm always, as I hope the, the audience is, uh, so moved by the stories because it reminds me that really the bottom line is it was only by the miracle of grace that any of this logic mm -hmm. or this history or mm -hmm. scripture uh, was opened into my mind. It wasn't my own intellect. I, if I were to summarize my journey as I look back, maybe the most important thing had to do not as a scholar, but as a pastor, feeling ex very eternally responsible for what I delivered to my people on a Sunday morning. And if I look back on wh why I became Catholic, that was the, the spark, because I recognize, I'm not a great intellect, but I recognize that this word is the infallible word of God, and so I saw it as the foundation for all truth, mm -hmm. and so when I got into the pulpit on a Sunday morning, my responsibility, the reason I was there was because of this word, not because mm -hmm. of an ordination, but because of this word. And so my responsibility was to deliver this word to the people, because I felt their salvation depended on it, not on my preaching, but on the word. And I say that what the Lord used to awaken that, besides getting in contact with my old seminary buddy Scott Hahn, was the recognition that on any given Sunday within a 15 mile radius of my pulpit, yep. there was 15 to 20 other pulpits mm -hmm. of men just like me that loved Jesus Christ and felt the, that the Bible was the sole foundation of our faith, but we taught such radically different things. Oh yes. From issues of theology, doctrine, morals, but I think what struck me more and more was the issue of salvation itself, how we understood what mm -hmm. is necessary for salvation. I had my view, the Methodist had his view, the Baptist, the Assembly of God, Church of Christ, Lutheran, Episcopalian, those Catholics way over there. And that was the stone in my shoe that eventually opened mm -hmm. my heart. Mm -hmm. First Timothy 3.15, the pillar and bulwark of the truth is the church. The church. And that was the spark that eventually. It was Newman, in the end, besides so many wonderful witnesses like Scott Hahn and so many others mm -hmm. in his many books, it was Newman. His essay is, um, uh, uh, his biography yeah. uh, was, uh, <coughs> I forget how it's, how it's said right Apologia now. Provita Apologia Sua. Apologia. Provita Sua. Provita Sua, which is read in great books yeah. classes convinced me I could no longer be a Protestant. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. But I wasn't quite ready to become Catholic. It was an essay on a development of doctrine that sealed the journey for me because one of the points he makes in there is that the, the acceptance of the authority of the papacy was accepted before the Trinity was defined mm -hmm. and the divinity of Christ. Uh, even the canon of scripture, we already see evidence of the development of the authority of mm -hmm. the bishop. So, I mean, that was the issue that brought me. My wife I relate so much to what you're saying because the issue of authority, <clears throat> now this, this is somewhere along in those four years of study, but, but I was starting, and in a Baptist environment, a congregational form of government, there's literally no one above me. <laughs> there was no one. Yeah. And I remember thinking at a certain point, you know, I'm going into my office because I, I preached expositorily through books of the Bible. And so I pull down this great scholar who happens to be a reformed scholar. Then I got this Lutheran guy over here, got an Anglican guy, got a Nazarene, got a Baptist. And I synthesize what they're saying. I bring it together and I walk up in the pulpit and I tell the people what I think the Bible is teaching. And just this realization coming over me slowly that there was no one above me, that it was just me. Yeah. And it was this me teaching, and and I knew my congregation would basically buy it because I studied more than they did, and you know, and yet right, right up the street, like, as you said, there's someone contradicting me. There's another one. Anyway, plus the books in your library were self-chosen. Yeah, and yeah. often the books we choose are the ones we like. Well, and they also agree with each us, other, or they contradict. We know. So. Yeah, you know, there 
We've been talking a lot about the issue of how do you know what's true? Is it through the Bible alone or is, is Christian history a witness and the teaching of the church and the tradition? But then there's the actual content of the deposit that's delivered by the tradition. Yeah. And for me, there was also an appeal in history because what the Catholic Church taught was objectively more beautiful, answered more deeply the questions of mm -hmm. my own human heart. And no one spoke to me more powerfully. I already talked about Augustine being a witness to the Catholic faith in antiquity. But what he actually said about God and the moral life and spirituality resonated so deeply in my heart and answered deep existential questions, deep longing. You know, um, one of the things that kept Augustine from being a Catholic for a long time was the, his understanding of the relationship of faith to reason. He thought, he thought that you couldn't be a Catholic, you couldn't be a Christian, and hold to the teaching of natural science, because he thought that natural science had contradicted the doctrines of Genesis. Do you think that's a new problem? It's a very it's ancient problem. And, and being deep in history helps us see that. I, sure. I remember us as a Protestant, and I'm going to ask you this question in a moment, but this idea of you know how important history was to us, and, and the mm -hmm. joke was often that a, a, a great variety... A uh, great percentage of non-Catholic Christians kind of know history from the apostles to Luther and not enough in between. But I, I remember in my own journey begging to differ with that because the danger is that if we didn't know that history, we would read back our presumptions mm -hmm. into that history. So in other words, where did the deposit of our faith come from? Did our Lord give the apostles a deposit of faith that therefore was protected and preserved and then became more verbal and mm -hmm. visible as the time needed? Or w did he just basically say, okay, guys, I'm going to heaven, just kind of run with it? You know, and, and there are many evangelicals that believe that, that mm -hmm. really it was a free-for-all and the Johannine and the Petrine, the different little communities mm -hmm. kind of developed their own things and it evolved into what we have. So this idea of history was, as I look back, was important. Now, if you go back, the two of you, maybe I'll start with you, uh, David. Uh, where, was history important to you in your pre-Catholic days as a Christian? Oh, sure. The reason I elected to study history is I wanted to know where I came from. And I recognize myself as a historical being. The meaning of my life is framed by a narrative as everyone's is, mm. and I wanted to be able to see where my narrative, my personal narrative, fell in relationship to my forefathers. Was that normal in your particular tradition? I don't know that it was. I mean, I had never heard the, the, the gospel preached to me in historical terms like that, other than simply to make the claim that Luther and Calvin had recovered antiquity. I don't know that there was a particularly historical angle to the yeah to the faith. It just it was something that spoke to me in my heart. And so I went into it realizing if I, if I can know the history, I'll be able to know better who I am. Did, in your particular tradition, Dr. Andrews, did you have kind of a knee-jerk answer to why there was this big jump from the apostles to Luther? I mean, in terms of a historical, quote, understanding of the early days in the church? Well, sure. I mean, there's a, there's a standard answer to that question within Protestant polemics. And the standard answer is that the papacy buried the gospel under a lot of superstitious smoke, largely in an exercise of self-aggrandizement, that the ambition of, mm -hmm. the, of the popes of Rome had smothered the gospel under a host of man-made traditions. There are a lot of reasons why that view of history is false, but one of them is that it's evident if you look around the ancient Christian world, not everybody recognized the authority of the pope in antiquity, and even those who did sometimes were removed from him geographically such that the Pope couldn't exercise an effective jurisdiction over churches in far-flung corners of the empire, except you know, maybe by a correspondence that could take centuries to play out. So if the Reformer's thesis was true, if Catholic tradition is really kind of the, the aggression of the Roman hierarchy to suppress the gospel, we should expect to find in communities remote from the Pope something that looks like Lutheranism. Mm -hmm. Right. If 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 Protestantism naturally flows forth from the pages of Scripture, we should find Protestantism flourishing wherever there is an absence of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what you find is something very different. If you go look in ancient Persia or southern India, 
or, or Ethiopia, Eritrea, Egypt, North Africa. Well, North Africa was, was Roman, but these, uh, Arabia, these places in the world that were remote from direct Roman influence, you find nothing remotely similar to Lutheranism, mm -hmm. nothing remotely similar to Calvinism. And it puts the lie to this Calvinist thesis that the Protestant religion just sort of spontaneously merges out of the Bible. No, Protestantism emerged in a very specific time and place. Saxony, Europe, Northern Europe in the early 16th century for reasons that were highly particular and very, very related to that social context. Mm -hmm. It's not the natural outgrowth of the Bible. It's a natural outgrowth of that particular historical era. Um, it's interesting when we look at that statement by Newman, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. It, it's almost as if it's just not history that awakens us to the fullness, but our ability to travel and to know these other cultures. Because at different mm -hmm. times, a person can live their whole life and have no clue what's going on in Ethiopia or India or different parts of the world. But as we begin to see their history and get to visit a church mm -hmm. in Ethiopia, we see that it ain't Lutheran. It's not Lutheran. It ain't yeah. Lutheran. And so our ability to see that is also another way of helping us being open to this history. Now, you were a former Presbyterian background. Well, there was this big Baptist long, the, the secret history of the true yeah. gospel, right? Did you yeah, hold and to that? I didn't really have, I didn't really have that in my arsenal. It, it was more what, what, um, what Dr. Anders just said. It was that view of the early church. But the thing that cracks me up really about Newman is his statement to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Because when I, when I think about it, I thought I was deep in history because most of the evangelicals around me only read contemporary theologians, or, or you read, you thought you were getting deep if you went back to D.L. Moody or something like that, you know? <laughs> and, you know and, Jonathan Edwards. Yeah, and I had begun to read Jonathan Edwards, and I'd yep. begun to read the Puritans, and so I was reading John Owen and John Bunyan, they're all named John, yep. I don't know why yep. you'd tell me. But Richard I, Baxter was... But I was reading so the Puritans, because I went to work for a bookstore that kind of uh, specialized in the works of the Puritans. It was a Calvinist bookstore. Yep. And so, I was reading the Puritans, and then going back, all the way back, I mean, all the way back to, to Luther himself. And I was reading Luther, and I was reading Calvin, and so compared to the people that I knew, I thought I was Mr. Deep in History, totally. <laughs> and that's why it, it, it really hit me when I first read uh, Newman, and he said, um, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. And then he, th then he went on a little, little stronger. He said, it's easy to show that the early church was not Protestant. And then in, in another place that I can almost paraphrase, I, I love the passage, I don't know what page it's on, but he says, if such a system of doctrine as Protestants believe existed in the early church, it has been clean swept away from the pages of history as if by a flood, right. by a deluge, just gone, you know. And I, I remember reading those things and just thinking, this guy is throwing down the gauntlet totally. And the answer that was typical, the answer that could be given is, well then, obviously since Jesus and the apostles were basically Baptists, or, or Lutherans or Presbyterians or something like that, and the early churches were obviously Baptist churches, or Presbyterian churches, or Nazareth, or some, something very much like it. The only reason you can't find them in history is because the Catholic Church has, they, you know, the victor writes the history, and, and we wrote them out of history. But what I found when I went back is that that didn't make any sense because there are plenty of heretical groups that, that we know from early history. We know about the Marcionites. We know about the Ebionites. We know about a lot of sects. And, and so it's not like the Catholic Church wrote them out of history and pretended like they never existed. We know them, the Montanists, yeah. so many others. But still, no, you can't find a Lutheran church. You can't find a Baptist church. And I, I, I still remember uh, searching history in some depth. And the day that I came home and I said to my wife, you know, it was, it was my, my famous little statement, I said, honey, I've been crawling around in the early church for a long time now. I've looked under every rock. I've looked behind every tree. And I said, honey, there is not a Baptist in sight. None. <laughs> and and so, uh, so Newman's challenge was, was very important to me. And the only thing I can say, I mean, I, lo I look back on it now and I think, why didn't I care about the early church? Or why didn't I care about the history between, you know, the, starting with the post-apostolic period and up, and up to Luther and Calvin? And it's just what David said. I just kind of knew that Catholicism was crazy. 
you know, um, and yeah, you know, the popes, you know, had just overlaid it with all this kind of magic and all this kind of weird stuff. So it, it was something I really didn't have to pay attention to. I really thought that. Well, I thought I was deep in history too. In fact, um, I yeah. loved reading history when I was a evangelical. I, at my particular seminary, we had strong history classes. Um, in fact, when I uh, graduated from, from seminary and was ordained, at first a congregationalist before I was Presbyterian, mm -hmm. one of the first courses, adult courses I taught at the local church was a course in church history. I thought I was deep in history. But the issue is that the lens through which I looked at history mm -hmm. ignored the uh, Episcopal government ignored the aspects. Yeah. I looked at it from La Tourette's view as a whole missions, mm -hmm. a history of missions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and different missionaries going out and the proclaiming of the gospel, mm -hmm. and how it was sometimes squelched by bad. So, in other words, I thought I was deep in history, but I was, I was deep in a a, a truncated view of history. I could have named Assisi, uh, Francis of Assisi and different popes and different people, but I had a slant on everything. I mean, was that a part of... What did you do with the, uh, with the sacramental, you know, the evidence of the sacramental nature of the church early on, baptism, the Eucharist? Well, you could study on. history and not talk about that stuff. Yeah, or, or you can just kind of assume that that's part of the church kind of sliding toward this magical direction and just sort of ignore it. Again, the issue was the proclamation of the gospel, going and make disciples of all yeah, nations, yeah. all these great witnesses, mm -hmm. uh, maybe burdened as Christian was in, in Pilgrim's Progress with this Catholicism that mm -hmm. they couldn't break free, but yet by God's grace, the gospel came through into Germany and into Ireland and into England with Augustine and all these different things. I mean, so there was that great history of seeing that, but in the process, mm -hmm. kind of missing the church. And I'm missing the significance of it. But now you were a historian, so you knew more about this. What did you think of the uh, sacramental view, nature of baptism or the Eucharist in the early church? And I first started studying church history in earnest when I was in seminary from men who knew the history very well. Mm -hmm. But they presented a kind of parody of the Catholic tradition. I mean, they, they, they put the elements of the faith in front of us, but then mocked them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like, well, you know, those Catholics, they were kind of crazy. You, you know, they were working them dead bones all the time. And you have to kind of, it was very much a, yeah. let, let's dismiss that. And then we'll, we'll find those brief, poignant moments where some sort of clarity shines through. And mm -hmm. That's very mm -hmm. much the way Calvin himself handled it. He, he mm -hmm. would have said that the faith had continued, but it was kind of limping along. You know, mm -hmm. and that and that people have a had a sort of wounded conception of the gospel, and they were clinging on to the creed and maybe to baptism amidst yeah. all these bare shadows. And and um, uh, how do you know which is Trinity or a different doctrine is true? And what I was taught it was the quasi unanimous acceptance of people in all places and all times mm -hmm. of a particular idea like Trinitarianism. So basically, it was a, a, a democratic vote that passed down through the ages well, if that's the by case, the Holy Spirit. If, yeah. if truth is found by the consensus of Christian people down through the era, then we must certainly throw out Lutheranism. Because if there's one thing mm -hmm. that's evident in the ancient church, no one in the ancient church, there was a, they may have disagreed about the Trinity, which they did. In fact, yeah. we had debates yeah. about the Trinity, about mm -hmm. the two natures of Christ, about all kinds of issues. One thing that no one in antiquity disputed no one disputed that we are saved through the renovation of our moral life. I don't care where mm -hmm, you mm -hmm, were on yeah. the Christian spectrum, in what heretical group, everybody believed that you had to have your interior life renovated mm -hmm. mor morally in order to be saved. Why don't we pause there, guys, and uh, we'll take a break. And I would like to suggest that uh, you viewers visit deepinhistory.com uh, to view... Uh, Many talks on history that are at the Coming Home Network website, as well as maybe some specific questions you might have about the place of history in our faith. Let's take a break. We'll come back. And forth.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and I'm joined today by two good friends, Kenneth Hensley, former Baptist minister, and Dr. David Andrews, former Presbyterian. And we're just talking about history, kind of inspired by John Henry Carnan Newman, who, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, it's anticipated that he'll be declared a saint this mm -hmm. about a year from now. Uh, we talked about history and kind of uh, dovetailing on Newman's statement about to be deep in history to cease to be Protestant. You talked about history in your former journey. What part did it play specifically in awakening you to the Catholic Church? You kind of hinted mm -hmm. at it, the two of you. But if you go back to it, was there a turning moment that history particularly played in that? Maybe we'll go to you, Ken. Well, well I mentioned Newman, and um, New Newman was a big one. Uh, uh, John Henry Newman was very, very important to me. The challenge that he threw down that led me to begin reading the early fathers. And yeah. my decision at that point was, because I'd taken church history also at Fuller Seminary, yeah. and I'd even yeah. taken church history in undergraduate studies. And so I thought, did I not read it? Um, <laughs> and, and the truth was, I, I hadn't read it. I had received kind of a, a condensation from my professor. And as David said a moment ago, they, they tend to present the Catholic view and then kind of make fun of it or something like that. So. I went back and began to read the, the early church fathers in, as, uh, in chronological order as, as best we know and began to read them straight through to get a real sense of the flavor, the feeling, the atmosphere, the, the smell, you know, the taste yep. of it. And, and I came away thinking, Newman is right. These are not Protestant churches. They're not evangelical, Baptist church. They're nothing like that. But, but let me jump to one other that's important to me and that kind of dovetails with something that David just said, too. Um, I read, um, I picked up a copy of Alistair McGrath's two-volume work, Eustitia Dei, mm -hmm. The Justice of God, mm -hmm. a two-volume history of the doctrine of justification. And Alistair McGrath is a very, very well-known uh, mm -hmm. Protestant, an Oxford theologian, a professor, and very well-respected. And I read his book, and he talked about the, the period of time before Augustine, first of all. And he says, in the earliest centuries of the church, you don't find a, develop, a, a developed doctrine of justification at all. What you really find are just paraphrases of statements from the New Testament, just descriptions lifting the, the very verbiage of the New Testament. He says, is when you come to Augustine that you have the first serious formalization, and when you do, salvation is conceived, justification is conceived as including the renovation of the interior person, you know, um, actually becoming holy. And then he goes on, I'm, I'm stepping through it quickly, but he goes through Augustine, then he goes through the period from Augustine to the Reformation, and he says there's no change. It's, a, it's the Catholic doctrine of salvation, in a nutshell, justification, all the way through to Luther. And then when he describes Luther's position, he, he makes statements like these. He says, Luther, who made this radical distinction between justification and sanctification, he says he made this distinction and no one had made the distinction before. He says no one had even conceived ever in the history of, the Christian, of, of Christian theology of, of the distinction that Luther was making there. And he goes on to call Luther's point of view a, what is it, theological? Complete theological novum. Yeah, a theological novum, a brand new idea in the history of theology. And I remember that being an important point to me. A May very I important qualify point. one yeah. thing that McGrath says? McGrath makes the point that prior to Augustine, there's no really developed doctrine of justification in yeah. the church. And that's true. That doesn't mean there wasn't a developed doctrine of salvation. <laughs> and this is something that mm -hmm. the Lutheran scholar Christopher Stendhal brings out in his work on Paul in mm -hmm. Palestinian Judaism, or Paul in, uh, uh, Paul in the Jews. There was a very well-articulated doctrine of salvation, just not in the terms that Paul gives us in Romans and Galatians. Mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. other Pauline texts and other mm -hmm, biblical texts mm -hmm. that framed it. We find it in Irenaeus, all the way back in the second century, who says that we regain in Christ what we lost in Adam, right, namely to be made to be made in the likeness and <coughs> image of God. Mm -hmm. And Saint, Saint Athanasius the Great says that God became man, that men might become mm -hmm, God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, so the idea of, of, a, of a mystical renovation of the human person after the likeness and image mm -hmm. of Jesus, through the sacraments in which we die with him in baptism mm -hmm. and are raised mm -hmm. again with him to new life, and then the whole 
legal and sacramental framework of the church presupposes mm -hmm. the life of grace and moral innervation. That's what the disciplinary structure was there to enforce, that if you fall away from the practice of morality, you would be excommunicated and have to do lengthy penance in order to come back right, in. Right. So that whole framework... Exactly. I was going to say every one of those words, but I just didn't want to take the time. So I'm just they're, they're, they're all yeah. very yeah. explicit in the tradition. So it's what, just that there wasn't a doctrine what, of justification. What Augustine did... Mm -hmm. Prior to Augustine, people read St. Paul as if he was talking about what he actually said he was talking about. <laughs> what was yeah. Paul talking about yeah. in those texts? How are yeah. Jews and Gentiles to get along, right. and how should Gentiles relate to the Mosaic Law? Right. And so prior to Augustine, Christians who were Gentiles by birth picked that up and go, oh, well, we got that one figured out. We don't mm -hmm. have to follow the Mosaic Law. Okay, next. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't really exegete Paul for a unique doctrine of salvation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Augustine's contribution, and to some extent maybe a, a deformation a little bit, was to read the doctrine of justification as if it were a catch-all for the doctrine of salvation. Mm -hmm. And so he imports a theological sense to that word that may have a sort of a wider valence than Paul himself intended. And McGrath draws yeah. that out. Yeah, he does. He admits that. He admits that. And, and, you know, when I read Augustine and I found that he was a Catholic, and it scared the pants off of me, I said, I'll read deeper into the tradition and see if maybe it gets better when I go earlier. But what I found were a set of controversies, not about justification, mm -hmm. but about morality and salvation that were so much more frightening to me. And the biggest was the doctrine of the second repentance. Do you remember that from the second century? No. The question, and we, we find it in the Shepherd of Hamas, we find uh -huh. it in Clement of Alexandria, we find it in Tertullian. The question is, and, and Justin Martyr uh -huh. alludes to it, can a baptized Christian sin and expect oh, to stay within the church? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and there was a strong presumption by many that no, that no, that that once you were baptized, mm -hmm. you might get one shot. But there was an expectation of a serious change of life. Mm -hmm. And Tertullian, the church, church, not church father, we don't call him a father, but early Christian writer Tertullian ultimately left the church because the Pope said, you know what, Jesus said 70 times 7? Mm -hmm. We're going to forgive you even if you're an adulterer or a murderer. And Tertullian couldn't handle that, so he split. But again, the presumption was that reconciliation with the church is a juridical act mm -hmm. that the Pope and the bishops have the authority given them by Christ to absolve your sin and readmit you to fellowship. But the principle of fellowship was a, a renovated mm -hmm. moral life and charity. You had to live a holy life in order to commune. That's why viaticum, reception of Holy mm -hmm. Communion, is so important because it's the bond of my visible unity with mm -hmm. the church. And those that were outside the church through penance had to be reconciled to Holy Communion before they died. And there's an example of, uh, of the data from history clarifying even Augustine. Absolutely. And going the data before Augustine mm -hmm. to clarify. But what you struck me with what both of you said, but is this idea of it being new with Luther. I mean, did that hit you? Like, wait, what do you mean? Blah, blah, blah. New. Yes, yes. I mean... Of course, Luther believed that he was going back to Paul in, in Paul's original meaning. But McGrath says no. But simply it's hearing new. that no one in the history of, of Christian thought had formulated that. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, it was very striking. So this was a, a awakening yeah. for you. Now Newman himself, and I wondered again if this connected with your, either of your parts. Where he, as he went back in history and particularly studied the fourth, the Arian controversy in the fourth century that as he's studying that, still in the back of his mind, trying to envision Anglicanism as a middle way between Catholicism and Protestantism, which was the background to the essay, but still even doing the Arian, that he's confronted with something he didn't anticipate, which, which was when he looked at the controversies, it awakened mm -hmm. him to, to his start of the journey. Either of you want to talk about that, that sure. point, that sure. thing that... Yeah. What was so it that, that, whoa! Newman, that, Newman recognized that there were combatants in theological controversy in antiquity who claimed for themselves the mantle of antiquity. Mm -hmm. They claimed to have the original gospel. What they lacked was the note of Catholicity, that there would be a sect set apart from the majority of the Christian world around the, around the globe. And it was Augustine who formulated the objection for him dealing with the Donatists of the 4th century, Securus Uticat Orbis Terrarum, the verdict of the whole world is conclusive. Augustine said to the Donatists, you can't be the Catholic Church because you're just in North Africa. Mm -hmm. 
And Newman saw that and recognized in an instant, I can't lay claim to Catholicity because I'm just in England. <laughs> That's where Newman, I think he says that he looked in the mirror and realized, I'm the heretic. I'm a, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and as I remember reading that it, it, for myself, mm -hmm. which was a stepping stone in my own journey toward the church and history, is that he realized that from a sola scriptura standpoint, in all those different arguments, he would have ended up on the wrong side right. mm -hmm. of the right. argument. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. Sola sure. scriptura was the point. That's why you have Arianism, because it was, a, it was breaking from the church, and a private interpretation of scripture was the background of all those early heresies. And so it's like, whoa, unless you study history, you don't realize not only that if you went back going on scripture alone, I might be on the wrong side, but that there are people today practicing the same heresies that were declared heresies years yeah. ago, but they're not aware of it. And then you're reading along, and I'm reading St. Vincent of Lorraine and his commonatorium, and mm -hmm. there's that fantastic passage where he says, um, if the heretic says to you, um, I'm not sure, I can't remember how it's set up, but he says, why should I, or if, it, 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 if you, I, I can't remember who asked who, but it's, why should I abandon the universal tradition of the church? He says, the heretic has a ready answer. He goes, because it is written. And he goes, immediately he will scamper through the entire Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, quoting passage after passage after passage. And of course, St. Vincent piles it up in it does a really humorous way. He says, he says, there's hardly a passage in Scripture that he won't allude to and stack up this gigantic passage of Scripture to prove his point of view. And yet it's a point of view that isn't held by the church and hasn't been held by the church. And, you know, all, all those passages hit me because I realized that that's me. That's me. For both of you, another point I remember that what history awakened for me was that unlike either of you, I was not a great scholar. Of, I read the Institutes of Calvin and I read much of Luther when I was in seminary. But I wasn't a scholar on it. However, what history awakened me to was the proof texting. Oh, yes. Yeah. Would either of you talk about that? I mean, that's what history awakens you to, is that you may have got a little bit of Augustine, but you didn't get Augustine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, well, go ahead. Well, it's, it's the polemical use of texts <laughs> is what it is. And, and all of us are prone to do this because mm -hmm. we have... A deep uh, confirmation bias. We we want to look for data that will confirm us in our prejudices because we don't like to be unsettled and we don't like mm -hmm. to be threatened. And this has been documented even in in social psychology today in laboratories, out, even outside the realm of religion. Whether you're talking religion, politics, or whatever, people don't like to be proved wrong, and they're very selective in their use of data. And I'm you know I mean I'm guilty of this too, right? Uh, and that's one of the reasons you have to dive in with both feet and, and, and immerse yourself in, and really the, the spirit and flow, as you tried to do, right? If you want to read your way through the fathers and mm -hmm. really get the, the measure of the thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when you do, you begin to realize that the things that motivated Augustine in particular, they were not the questions that motivated Luther. Christopher Stendhal, his book on uh, St. Augustine and the introspe introspective conscience of the West, is what brought that out to me hmm. most clearly. Luther was motivated by his unfectun, his, his neurotic fear of sin and guilt and damnation. And he takes that as a lens that he imposes on the entire tradition, makes mm -hmm. that the normative framework for thinking about Christian life. And all you have to do is read widely enough and you know that all Christians yeah. have a consciousness of sin, but not like Luther did. <laughs> you know, Not like Luther did. And they're animated by a whole different set of questions. And all the church fathers were. You just don't find that kind of tormented Lutheran conscience anywhere in antiquity. Yeah. And you can, yes, you can excise a, a, you know, text here or there and, and, and bend them to suit your polemical purposes. But if you, that, it, it's false to any, any claim to continuity with antiquity. I, I never realized until I read the early church fathers in, in a continuous sense, mm -hmm. like as opposed to pick and choose I had been given in seminary the early belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. I mean, that oh, was certainly. such an awakening. Was mm -hmm. that also a big part in your journey yes. to seeing the, real, the, the continuous voice in belief all the way from the beginning, all the way through? Yeah, another book that was important to me was written by an Anglican scholar, historian J.N.D. Kelly, oh, his, yeah. his book, Early Christian Doctrines. Mm -hmm. And to, to watch him pile up the evidence from the early fathers of a of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, the belief, and how universal it was, and, and on baptism as well, that he comes to a, a summary statement 
where he just says flat out, he says the, the, that the teaching of the early church definitely was that in baptism, original sin is washed away, the gift of the Holy Spirit is given, you know, regeneration occurs. And he, he, he just states these as though they're facts. And an, another historian that I read was um, Yaroslav Pelikan. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he, he did the same thing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. He assesses all the information and he basically lays out this conclusion that you, you, you can't avoid the fact that this was the teaching of the church. And in fact, if, if I remember right, I don't think that the doctrine of the, you can correct me, <laughs> I know you know more, um, I don't think the doctrine of the real presence was seriously questioned until Rat Burtis and Rat Tramnus yeah. in like what the ninth yeah. or 10th century or something. Now, nine centuries is a long time. Yeah. And, and so, you know, another thought that came to my mind was, you know, if, if, if our Lord and if the apostles did not teach the real presence of, of, of Jesus in the Eucharist, how could the church go astray as quickly as it did? Because all the way back, it's teaching it. I mean, you, you can't yeah. find a place where it's not teaching it. How do they go astray so quickly? How does the church go astray so universally? And why isn't there anyone complaining about it? Yeah. Why isn't there a controversy, at least? I mean, the closest thing you can find to a controversy is that, that one statement in um, St. Ignatius of Antioch where he speaks of those who deny um, that Christ is present in the Eucharist. What's that passage again? Yeah. You know, he says there are some who, who yeah. say... But they also not, deny that Christ has a body. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah he, he says, and they're perishing in there, you know. So they were Yes. Yeah, so there's someone saying it, but, but my point is, I would think that you would at least find a movement somewhere. I mean, you know, one of the apostles or their successors standing up and saying, hold on, hold on, this is not what we taught. And so to see the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist taught so universally, taught so quickly, taught everywhere, and not even disputed until Rad Burtis and Rad Tramnus come along about a thousand years later. I mean, that and, was... And if it was always that, That's long. powerful evidence, especially when you know that you're operating on a pick-and-choose, yeah. me-and-my-Bible, you know, basis. I, yeah, and if it was wrong all those years, then where was the Holy Spirit in the midst of this that our Lord promised would lead his people into truth? Yeah, and you read the Reformers or, or you read their descendants, and it's, uh, the Bible is clear number one. And if you just pray and the Holy Spirit will lead you to the truth. And I knew well enough, you know, as you mentioned a while ago, I knew well enough that there were pastors all over the area that were smarter than I was, who undoubtedly prayed more than I do, and, and sought the leading of the Holy Spirit more than me, and, and came to contrary conclusions uh, to those that I came to, that um, I, I remember this image coming into my mind at a certain point where I thought, you know what, if I could parachute back and I just, you know, you just drop Ken Hensley in the third century or the fourth century. And I look around and the church believes in these things, these Catholic doctrines, you know. And I, I thought, would you say to them, would you have the gall to say, you're all wrong because I'm really smart and I study my Bible really hard. You're all wrong. And I'm, so I'm going to start this new church called the Ken Hensley Church. I mean, would I do that? And it, it, it's like it. it, it it instantaneously seemed to me like that, that would have to be the height of arrogance, that the only humble position you could possibly take would be to take your seat in this church with Augustine, with Cyprian, with Ambrose, and with the others. You know, I remember in those early days, the seminary and pastorate, that there was, there was somebody out there in the news called a Jim Jones, yeah, uh, who started out fine as a I think a Methodist pastor, or maybe he was Baptist, I can't remember, but eventually he was calling himself I think he was God. I think he was Presbyterian. And uh, taking his people out of California yeah. uh, then, uh, to, uh, to a place where he all gave them Kool Aid. So, I mean, how do you make sure that you're not misguided and that you're, uh, you're and the person you're following is trustworthy? I mean, that's one of the issues. I remember th this coming home to me in, a, in a, this thing about history in a stunning way when my, my, my wife, I, I gave my wife who wasn't interested in Catholicism, I gave her a job of typing up all these quotations from the early church fathers for me. And she was typing up all this stuff on <laughs> baptism, you know. And, uh, and so she was absorbing it. And we're sitting in church one Sunday night and some conversation started about baptism after the evening service. And, and my wife, who doesn't usually join in in those kinds of conversations, she, she pipes up and she says, well, uh, Polycarp said, and she starts uh, paraphrasing something <laughs> about <laughs> baptism. <laughs> And my associate pastor said, oh, Polycarp can go fish. <laughs> and I feel like there, there it was something, it's like another gear turned in me where I thought, and, and I could see a gear turning in my wife's head, you know, just sort of like, he doesn't even care. Polycarp knew St. John. I know, he doesn't care yeah. about Polycarp. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, that those are the beautiful little things of, of becoming deep in history is this idea that Polycarp nude St. John, or, our Lord choosing the apostles, and those apostles had their own disciples, and one of those we have his letters from. You know, and, and yet Polycarp can go fish because I just go yeah, straight to the Bible. It's, it's well, you know, amazing. We, we, we keep talking about how we know the truth of Christ, but even after I became persuaded that Protestantism was not historical and the Catholic Church was, there was the added benefit that the truth I found in the Catholic Church was salutary. Mm -hmm. And it answered questions in my life that my Protestantism <coughs> did not answer. And it solved problems for me that I couldn't get solved in Protestantism. And it changed my life in ways Amen. that my Protestantism was not changing it. So it's true, but it's also good. Beautiful, yeah. rich. And that brings us to, we got about five minutes left, and, and uh, my guests again are Ken. Mm -hmm. Hensley and uh, Dr. David Anders, maybe as a thought to close, we've looked at uh, how the history brought you into the church. You've both been in the church 15 or more years. Uh, why is being deep in history continuously important for Catholics, especially at a time when all of us recognize we're going through rough times in our culture, in our church? You know, people sometimes ask me, how can you be in a church that has so many problems, you know, corruption, this or that, cleric or bishop does a bad thing. I say, look, I became Catholic after I studied the medieval church for 10 years. I wasn't surprised by clerical corruption. I was surprised by clerical holiness, you know. <laughs> and you don't judge the church in a, in a singular individual unless they're a saint, mm -hmm. right? I think there are two ways you can evaluate it. One of them is you can look to the saints, those who really did cooperate with the full measure of grace, and you see the fruit of a Catholic life well lived. That's all the proof you need. But then you can also look at the, at the course of the church, not in a single person, but in the course of history down through the ages. And I challenge anyone, read Tom Wood's book, How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization, for example, to see the imprint of Catholicism mm -hmm. on world history, the dignity of the human person evolving into a doctrine of human rights, the doctrine of creation, of revelation and reason mm -hmm. developing into the modern university and the scientific method. Look how it has affected canon law, its, its imprint in, in civil codes and, and principles of justice and fair dealing in civil society. Take one aspect of modern culture and after another that we value, mm -hmm. you're going to find the roots of those things that we value in the Catholic tradition, working its way like leaven and dough mm -hmm. throughout the course of all of human history. I want to be part of that stream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You cut yourself off from that stream. It's back to barbarism. Yeah. yeah. Ken. Amen. Yeah, yeah and, and I guess what I will throw in is just a, the, 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 the very, some, something personal that my conception of Christianity as an evangelical was that there were Jesus and the apostles, and then there's an inspired book that he, he basically just tossed it out and said, do your best. <laughs> and, and then there are individuals. I didn't have a sense of the church as a corporate entity. You know, there were just individuals, the invisible church. There are individuals all through history and all the way, you know, scattered all over the world who know Jesus. And I live my, my personal relationship with Jesus. Well, now, uh, you know, I, I love the sense of being part of, of a family on earth. And this is where church history comes in. A family that goes all the way back. I was in an evangelical, a non-denominational church to, just recently for the first time in a long time. And I walked in, I looked around, there were no statues, there were no, there was, it was nothing, you know. Um, I almost accidentally genuflected before going into the pew, but everyone was just talking and going into the pew and all that. And then the next morning I was taken to, it, it was at a wedding, then the, the next morning I was taken to a, a, a Polish Catholic church in a small co uh, country, I mean a small town in, in uh, rural Michigan. And Around the entire church were the stained glass windows of all these saints. You know, they, they take me all the way back to the beginning. I looked up front and I saw our Lord on the cross, bleeding and dying. There was Mary, there was Joseph, there was the, you know, there was the Holy Family, and there were all these saints. And there was just a feeling to me immediately of, I love having this family, and I love being a part of a family. It's not just me and Jesus in my Bible anymore. Yeah, so, it's, it's very humbling, which... So that reminds us we're a big we're a big part of this thing. Where it's not enough for us to start from scratch and come up with the true understanding of things for the first time in history. No, we've received. We've, we've received, received and now our responsibility is to pass it on it faithfully. Down. That's really our, Amen. our responsibility. Thank both of you. Hey, thank you for thank you. joining us Appreciate here it. and on your work and
and uh, those of you watching, uh, we're encouraging you to become deep in history. And so uh, how do you do that? Well, uh, we've been given the gift of the catechism. Yeah, it's a great place to look at the, the entire idea of our thought and how it flows from scripture and tradition. But I also want to remind you of two sources very quickly. EWTN's website has, of course, many resources, <laughs> videos, and such. And come to the Coming Home Network website or deepinhistory.com. We have dozens of free history talks that will touch on avenues of the journey in relationship to how history helps one become deeper in their Catholic faith. God bless you. See you again next week. Thank you.